altogether. I'm just going to speak to the camera to say, I'm sorry, but I'm looking away into the room during the course of this, so I hope you'll forgive me. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Green. I'm the secretary of the Friends of Julian of Norwich. Um, and and we're very pleased, a colleague of mine is here as well, to uh, have just had this walk published a couple of days ago, just in time for its first inaugural walk. And the reason I brought it here for you on your seats is that um, quite a lot of the references along the walk are to the churches that had anchor holds, um, which is the subject of today's talk. So if you want to go and see some of the places and indeed a little bit of physical evidence of exactly where they were, most of them, we don't know exactly where they were. Some of them we do, and the evidence is in the walk. You've also got little bookmarks um, with a QR code to take you to the rest of the program, um, which will be carrying on until the autumn. So I've got absolutely no pretensions uh, to be an expert on hermits, anchorites or recluses. This isn't my talk reflecting the latest scholarship on the subject. Carol Hill is the person who's best at that. And I thought she might just be here today, but she's not well, I'm afraid. But she has built upon the work um, of what we're having today, which is a reading of a, the commemorative essay that was written 50 years ago this year by F.I. Dunn who was the assistant archivist at the Norfolk and Norwich Records Office, it says. It's an opportunity for us all to reflect, not just on medieval hermits, um, with particular reference to medieval Norwich, that's the full title of the essay, but it's also an opportunity, if there's knowledge in the room, for us to collectively reflect just briefly on the organisations that produced uh, this essay uh, and on... Uh, F.I. Dunn particularly. So it comes from this uh, uh, production that was produced by the Julian of Norwich 1973 Celebration Committee um, because they worked out that it was 600 years uh, since she had had her visions and a much less well-known figure then than she is now. Uh, and a group of people got together, produced this document which is, uh, has a charming set of uh, uh, seven or eight commendations from bishops and archbishops and things, including Sir Alec Guinness, for some reason, was asked to um, contribute to the welcoming of people to read this document. Um, and it's from this that I've, I've taken today's reading. So does anybody know, I think I've just met somebody who does know, so it's a rhetorical question, anything about the author, F.I. Dunn? Does anybody yeah. else other than Frank know him? Frank, with a loud voice, tell us what you know about uh, F.I. Dunn. Well, I'm so old. I can remember <laughs> Ian Dunn. When I first came to the archive here in 74, he was then the senior archivist. So although he's called F.I. Dunn, he's always known as Ian Dunn. And he was, I suppose you call him a high churchman, and had a particular interest in recluses and permits. And he, uh, at that time, was very closely associated with some other names and the others of what well, you may remember, Frank Say, I think, the local historian at the local Southern Library, in the forum in the main library building at that time. And they both had this common interest in the permits for courses of medieval knowledge. And he put together a talk that Howard is now giving you. And uh, through, because he yeah, obviously had the skills of reading the Latin, he was able to put, pull together. The kind of document you're going to see later on, actual wills that mention permits, um, anchorites, and in our case, particularly Julian. Those are a treat for later. Absolute treat to see those original wills. Thank you. They're going to be referred to a little bit here. So he was the assistant archivist. Is there an assistant archivist in post at the moment? Mm -hmm. such a thing called an assistant archivist. Doesn't exist. <laughs> he says he came from the Norfolk and Norwich Record Office. You're now the Norfolk Record Office. Does anybody know how that happened? Where did the Nor the Norwich bit disappear to? I think it just to make it sound easier to pronounce. You know, oh, I see. We are still our responsibility for the record of the city of Norwich and we are Norfolk. Norfolk. Right. Okay. Well, that's solved that one for me. I'm going to finish the reading a little bit before the end of the material, partly because of the delivery time. And partly because at the very end, some fascinating stuff, not about uh, Julian so much as about Dame Catherine Mann, who was the last surviving uh, uh, anchor anchoress 
after a long history of really quite a few in Norwich, um, who, when the Reformation came and that all had to come to an end, the city uh, fathers needed to know what to do with poor Catherine, who was you know, left on the beach of history, uh, unable to be an anchoress, but unable to earn a living any other way, because that's what she was. And it's a lovely story of uh, how the city council actually gave her a pension and treated her very well uh, and made sure that she was OK. So she was uh, up at the Blackfriars Hall and that bit, I'm afraid I'm going to miss out. Uh, you have to do your researches for her elsewhere. She's Dame Catherine Mann. So I promise to keep going, but because this is 50 years old, and if anybody does know of anything that needs to be corrected or wants to chip in, do chip in. I, I won't let us get uh, distracted for too long, but please feel free to chip in if you'd like to. So the essay that I'm going to read to you from that book is prefaced with a reading from uh, Piers Plowman by William Langland. So the date you need to remember for her... Um, visions is on your badge 1373 keep that in your heads as a as a bellwether and everything else relates to that so uh piers plowman written between 1370 and 1386 according to the bit of research i've read completely contemporaneous with julian um and here is the prologue that ian ian gave us some put them to pride and apparelled themselves so in a display of clothing that they came disguised. To prayer and penance put themselves many, all for the love of the Lord, living hard lives in hope for to have heavenly bliss, such as anchorites and hermits, hermits that kept them in their cells and desired not the country about to roam, nor with luxurious living, their body to please. And some chose trade and they fared better. So it's a description of a variety of walks of life of which they picked out these hermits and anchorites because they were pretty common. Um, it wasn't a weird and wonderful thing that we're trying to get our heads around today. It was common at the time. It is often difficult we have here for the modern mind to sympathize with that section of the religious community of medieval times which chose the comparative peace of the monastery and like milton we cannot praise a fugitive and cloistered virtue unexercised and unbreathed that never sallies out and sees her adversary that's from the air uh, air Aero I'm going to get it wrong. Areopagitia, a book in which he de defends free speech, famously 1644. Still more difficult it is then for us to see an immediate worth in those who are commonly thought to represent the most extreme expression of the movement, the anchorites and the hermits. This booklet, with the remarkable Julian of Norwich as its focus, attempt a more sympathetic and impartial examination of medieval monasticism. And this essay will hopefully give a more accurate and factual account of that group of persons, of which Julian was but just one, that has been readily available since the excellent book by Rotha Mary Clay on the subject, published as long ago as 1914. So it's quite a stable subject matter. The main book still is the 1914 book. We have here a 50 year old essay, which hasn't been debunked badly. Um, and the 1914 book was digitized by Google in 19, uh, sorry, 2007. You can get it there and was republished indeed by Methuen um, 104 years after it was first published in 2018. So the base knowledge was known a century ago and is still fairly current. Norwich, in fact, provides the best possible field of study in this case, since more anchorites and hermits are known to have lived in the city than in any other English town. Well over 50 separate recluses can be identified from various documentary sources from the 13th century to poor old Catherine Mann at the Reformation. As opposed to London, which furnishes only about 20 examples. Lynn has about 13 
In addition, Norwich was the only city in England to have contained beguinages or small communities of religious women living a semi-enclosed life together, though members of no particular established order. That is a contested issue now as to whether there were or weren't beguinages in Norwich, but uh, lay communities, not fully in a monastery, not all on their own, but living an intentional life together is a feature and whether they can technically be called beguinages or not is a matter for scholars. Anchorites are known in the city from about 1250. Though it is of interest to note that very few examples have been found since around 1320, until Julian herself in 1373, that's your key date, after which date references become relatively plentiful again it would be pleasant to think that perhaps she inspired a resurgence of a way of life that was maybe becoming less favoured. Of the spiritual aims and manner of the anchorites and the hermit's life, this uh, the convention of this essay is to write in the male format, anchorite rather than anchoress. I'm going to leave the text to speak for itself in that regard. Of the main spiritual aims, we're well informed as several medieval works on the subject have come down to us, of which the most celebrated is the English version of the book called the Ancrin Rule or the Ancrina Visa, which is a rule or a written guide, in this case specifically for anchoresses. The physical side of their existence is less well documented, however, and must needs be pieced together from perfunctory documentary evidence and scanty physical remains of which we are going to be able to see some today. Unfortunately, no anchoresses or hermitages, so anchorages or hermitages separate from churches survive in Norwich, despite a misplaced um, subscription on a fragment of the White Friars. But the indication is that there was no rule for the situation of such dwellings. The Blackfriars Anchorage, Blackfriars Hall, seems to have been on the north side of the choir. It's referred to in the um, trail that you have there, and you can, you're pointed towards the three external arches that you can see uh, that's being referred to here. Um, the Cathedral Priory had anchorages to the south of it. Blomfield informs us that at St John's Sepulchre, a recluse, a recluse dwelt in a cell joining to the north side of the steeple, while some anchor houses were at the gates of the city. Others were at the bridges, as were several hermitages. The cathedral recluse lived in an elevated seclusion almost over St Luke's Chapel. The White Friars anchoresses lived underneath Holy Cross Chapel at one time. As to the position of the anchorage at St Julian's, there are several schools of thought, one of which cites it in the traditional position against the southeast wall of the church, which is where it has been reconstructed today. But Ian is personally of the opinion, he says, that Blomfield was accurate in his statement. Blomfield wrote between uh, no, he lived between 1705 and 1752. He wrote that in the east part of this churchyard stood an anchorage in which anchoresses or recluses dwelt until the dissolution. When that house was demolished, though the foundations may still be seen in 1750, by 1752. So that's an indication that it wasn't as linked to the church at all. Um, who knows? Robert Baxter made a bequest in 1429 to the anchoress in the churchyard. His words were in Symmetrio at St. Julian's Conisford, to the anchoress in the churchyard of St. Julian's Conisford. While in 1503, Agnes Thorpe left one pound, six shillings and eight pence to a priest for to sing before the anchoresses of St. Julian's. 
This would hardly have been necessary had the anchorage been attached to the chancel of the church, where the traditional hagioscope or squint, commanding a view of the altar where divine offices could regularly be witnessed. It is, of course, possible that both theories are correct and that the anchorage moved, as it did in neighbouring St. Ethelreda's, Ethelreda's uh, which is also just down the road in King Street, where the priory refector paid sixpence for carting the walls of an anchor house outside the churchyard in 1304, presumably to recite it or to do something with it anyway. He paid for the moving of the walls. The nature of the anchorage or cell is best described actually by foreign writers. Rimilacus, in his regular solitorium, which was written back in the 9th or 10th century, directed that it be a very small area, surrounded by a small garden, which often seems to have been regarded as part of the cell or the enclosure. A Bavarian rule stated that the anchorage should be of stone and should be 12 feet square. A fine surviving example at Hartlip in Kent agrees very well with this description, though some were obviously much bigger. And as the even better example at Chesterler Street, which has four rooms, one indeed an upper chamber. There's but one testament surviving of a Norwich anchoress, that of Catherine, different Catherine, anchoress of St. Mary Newbridge, sorry, St. Margaret Newbridge, which is where I did look this up and I've forgotten it. Does anybody know where St. Margaret Newbridge was? I'm looking at Frank, no, <laughs> forgive me. Okay, it's a city church um, in 1315, but no actual will is attached to the testament. Um, and uh, there is no furniture or personal property mentioned in that will. There are, however, three extant wills made by Norwich hermits themselves. Thomas Bassett, 1435, he left four shillings in cash and an image of St. Anthony. And he also left his utensilia, his utensils. John Levitt in 1509 left two pounds in cash, while Richard Furness in 1464 bequeathed a number of possessions, including a brass bowl, a plate, a cloak, two pictures, three pairs of sheets, and three pounds in cash. Despite this information, it is again the author of the Ancran rule who gives the best picture of the interior of an anchorage. There are for him to be three small windows. And this is why we, uh, this is referred to frequently in relation to the reconstruction of Julian's cell at the moment at St. Julian's church. Three small windows, one opening onto the church, one to the servant's chamber, and one communicating with the outside. The curtains are to be black, showing that you yourselves are black and of no value in the eyes of the outside world. But they should be worked with a white cross, symbolizing the keeping of pure chastity, which is guarded with much difficulty. Many and particular are the rules given for the use of these windows. No conversation is to be held through the church window, which should be reverenced because of the holy sacrament, which you can see through it. The house window is for communication with the servant and the outside window is for use of other people. Marjorie Kemp, as we know, visited Julian and she would have had to speak to Julian through that outside window, if that's the way her place was set up. But in this latter window lie hidden perils. Great emphasis is laid on the undesirability of peeping out. And gossiping anchoresses had apparently become proverbial by the 13th century. In quotes, from mill and from market, from smithy and from anchor house, one hears the news.
on no account was a recluse to let herself be seen or put out of or put out her hand. This specific danger uh, uh, is a fascinating hint as to the medieval concept. This is what he writes. I'll read you what he writes. The medieval concept of beauty, for it is apparently the beauty of a woman whose face is not burned by the sun, with a quotation that he doesn't ascribe to. It's that that lures men into licentiousness. I've just come back from India, <laughs> where there's exactly the same feeling. As pale a skin as you can have in India, in the part that I was in, was an absolutely straightforward thing. Poor people who are out in the sun enough to have dark skins. Similarly, back to the essay, carrying the head high, blinking of the eyes, pursing of the mouth, speaking like an innocent and affecting a lisp. All of these are calculated to inflame the passions. Devout men were allowed to peep through at the altar while the anchoress discreetly withdrew, but were to be given a curt reply if they asked where the anchoress slept or allowed their eyes to wander in the direction of the bed. Not even the bishop was allowed to behold her face and the story of St. Martin, who honoured an anchoress for refusing to expose herself thus, is quoted in support of this argument. One is left with an impression from the anchoring rule that for the strictly orthodox recluse, recluse, windows were a necessary evil more. In quotes, I believe that our enemy, the warrior of hell, shoots more bolts against one anchoress than against 77 ladies living in the world. The battlements of the castle are the windows of her house. Meals were not to be taken with anyone outside the cell and strangers were to be entertained, if really necessary, by the servant, with the anchoress making a few friendly gestures at the uh, appropriate window. Keeping of animals was to be discouraged except for our famous cat, presumably to keep vermin at bay and understanding the relationship of that particular anchor hold to the port, not very far down to the river, and all the rats that brought the plague uh, from, from those boats, one might see the value of that cat. Notwithstanding those pictures referred to above, which Richard Furness and that image of the saint owned by Thomas Bassett's, the stricter rules discouraged any kind of representations, except for a crucifix, which was to be set on a simple altar covered with a white cloth. The abbot Aylred permitted the addition of an image of the Virgin and St. John. Clothing was naturally to be simple and not to follow fashion with embroidered girdles or brooches or any other kind of pious uh, semi-monastic habit. The clerics uh, who were anchorites and those belonging to one of the religious orders probably wore their appropriate garb, however, because you could be an anchorite as well as a priest, you could be an anchoress as well as a nun, but our Julian by all accounts was neither of those, she was a lay person. Food was to be naturally simple, consisting of bread, cheese, pottages, and very little meat. Presumably drink was similarly austere, consisting of milk and beer, small beer. In 1455, Julian Lampert, anchoress of Caro, paid two shillings and tenpence for ale and brewing within the monastery. The question of food brings us to a rather more basic question as to uh, the source of the recluse's income. How do they live? As must be now obvious, they were frequent objects of charitable bequests in wills at least in Norwich. Oddly enough, such requests are met with much more rarely in London or Chester. It is significant that clergy are as frequent as the laity in the making of bequests to recluses of all kinds in Norwich, including the Beguines. Uh, obviously, they pose no threat to the work and the orthodoxy of the priests. They were looked on with favour, one might say. If people were as charitable in their lifetime 
then it begins to be more understandable how persons with no apparent income or endowment could take up the eremitical life. There's a map in the booklet, and he says referencing the map, which shows the large number, I'll open that up and put it on the table for when you leave, the large number of sites, reference to the map will immediately show that the receipt of regular arms was of the utmost importance and cells tended to be cited with just this in mind. They're on main streets. There was one at every city gate, except brazen doors, and at all but one of the bridges. Passing trade, more chance of arms. Moreover, it can be assumed that churchyards were not the unfrequented spots in the Middle Ages which they later became. In fact, it would be a great disgrace for a recluse to have to admit um, that they joined in the dance in the churchyard, or that they watched it, or they watched the wrestling or other foolish sports therein. All of that according to the anchoring rule. But this did not prevent the receipt of gifts, and Langland, whose poem started the, uh, the essay, observed somewhat wryly, an anchoress here, a box hangeth, a box for the pennies. It's evident that anchorites and hermits came to be accepted as very much a part of the local religious scene. And towards the end of the 15th century, bequests tended to be made to each anchor or hermit in the city as a whole, as a matter of course, just as in each friary, rather than to individually named recluses in particular sites, as was the case formerly. Most of these bequests were made quite unconditionally, but a few required masses or prayers to the testator's soul. That of Agnes Thorpe has regularly been noted. Robert Janis, sometime mayor of Norwich in 1530, bequeathed quite late, just before they were abandoned, bequeathed a regular income of one shilling and one pence to each anchor and anchoress of the city every three months for the next 20 years. While Robert Baxter's bequest of £40 in 1432 to Richard Furness was by far the largest sum known to have been left to an individual recluse. In addition to what was given to them, there's evidence that several Norwich recluses owned property. Other, um, other than that in which they lived and for which they probably received some sort of rent or income. By an undated 13th century charter, um, confirmed to the Abbot of Langley um, in return for an annual payment of six shillings, a tenement in Bitthorpe was held, um, which she held of him. So the anchoress rented a property from the bishop and then got the rent from it for her own um, living and presumably got a margin between those two. A property is recorded in the city roll for 1305, which is a particular interest to me, abutting the messuage. Is that the right way to pronounce it? Thank you very much. A messuage is a dwelling house without buildings and land, perhaps with it. The messuage of one Cecily, who is anchoress of St. Mary Combuste. And I believe that my house and garden are on top of the church of St. Mary Combuste in Golden Dog Lane. Uh, and we're doing some research underground to try and find it. Uh, but anyway, so she, Cecily, had another house, quite a big one somewhere. Um, it's referred to as being next door to this other property in the deed. And it's the rent from there that must have helped her along her way. 1306, unlikely to have known Julian. Um, and also there's a messuage of Catherine, anchoress of St. Margaret of Newbridge Church that I mentioned before. Ah, oh, I found it here. It's underneath the Playhouse Theatre. So that bridge that brings over the river, it would have been just there on the left, that one. So next time you're going there, somebody lived in silence and solitude with a lifetime of prayer just there. It was presumably this last named house which Catherine left in her will made in 1315 to be sold and the profits were to be distributed for the good of her soul and to pay her debts. So to give the last word to the author of the Anchorin Rule again, from good people accept all that you need, but see that you do not get the name of an acquisitive anchoress. <laughs> <laughs>
That's provided for then. How did the recluses spend their time? A natural assumption is that they uh, devoted it, uh, it to long hours of contemplation and meditation. Yet, oddly enough, though it is these ideas that are the main preoccupations of Richard Roll and Walter Hilton, Richard Roll died in 1349 in Yorkshire, mm -hmm. and Walter Hilton died in 1396 in Nottinghamshire, both left um, written texts. The Ladder of Perfection is the famous one. Um, the Fire of Love is Richard Rolls. Um, the main preoccupations of those two is not contemplation and meditation, but rather the correspondingly greater emphasis on the ascetic element, the pursuit of virtue, the avoidance of sin. It may be wise to regard Julian of Norwich as untypical of that class of religious community, of which she was one of the most celebrated, since officially visions were somewhat to be frowned upon. Uh, if you think you've seen a vision, in quotes, whether in a waking state or in a dream, count it as no more than a delusion, for it is only his, the devil's, deceit. The recluse was strongly advised to read as an aid to prayer and to foster true devotion. And there's ample evidence that many, if not the majority of the recluses were literate. Julian says she's unlettered, but she clearly could read English. An anchorite of Lynn was reputed to have produced the first English Latin dictionary. I didn't know that. And Julian's own claim to be a woman that could know letter, C-O-W-D-E, that could know letter is her phrase, is probably no more than the medieval literary convention employed by many writers of the period. Chaucer, not accepted, he also said he could know letter. Richard Furness left a psalter in his will, and Catherine Mann, who's here again, was presented with two books by Thomas Bilney, of which more later. Uh, basically, anchoresses were recommended to spend a good deal of their day in liturgical and private prayers. Presumably, those dwelling against churches could witness each service that took place within, but the anchoring rule advises them actually to take communion only about 15 times a year, lest customs stale it. Some mention has been made of servants whose attention to the physical needs of the recluse would have enabled them to spend more time in devotion. Furness left a bequest to a woman described as his custos, his helper, while Julian herself is known to have had two servants. They're even named, we know them as Alice and Sarah, from testamentary evidence. Julian has had two, maybe different times, as did Julian Lampert. Not that the anchoresses herself were to be unmindful of house wifery. Among the common sins to be confessed were neglecting to mend your clothes, leaving them out in the rain, leaving them unwashed, and so forth. One rule directs, wash yourselves as often as you please. While another quotes a saying of St Bernard of Clairvaux, I have loved poverty, but I never loved filth. What recluses often did do is ascertainable from what they were enjoined to desist from. Naturally, a physically enclosed cell with a permanent resident um, would be a good repository for valuables. But the anchoring rule warns, do not keep other people's things in your house, dear daughters. Possessions, clothes, chests, deeds, accounts, indentures, the church vestments or the vessels, unless necessity or violence compels it or very great fear. St. Richard of Chichester, 1246, similarly forbade recluses to have charge of vestments. Nor was the anchoress to turn into a schoolmistress, though her maiden could give lessons to some other girl. Handicrafts in moderation were permissible. However, and the most famous example of a recluse's work is perhaps the illumination, I did not know this, of the Lindisfarne Gospels, no less. Or, on a humbler level, an anchoress could cut out and sew and mend church vestments and garments for the poor, and could, by leave of her confessor, 
sell things that she made herself to meet her needs. So there was, a, by all accounts, a range of strictness about uh, what was allowed. And I guess the more impecunious the anchoress might be, the more they might stretch the rule. Sorry, I'm, I don't know why I'm speaking. I shouldn't do so. Rofa Mary Clay, the author of that book from 19... Uh, 15, um, mentioned above, lays great stress on the function of, of hermits in keeping the roads and the bridges in repair. It is recorded in the Norwich Assembly minutes for October the 3rd, four, 1840, sorry, 1483, that, in quotes, Robert Goddard, hermit, should have his residence above the Needham gates of the city ditches, extending through to the Aldermary of St. Stephen's. So that's our St. Stephen's, and the gate is the, well, I don't know what it's called. It's the one at the end of um, St. Stephen's Church, no, St. Stephen's Street. Those gates had a hermit above to keep them uh, in repair, and the, that person, the, uh, the hermit, should also keep the room and the solar building, which is occupied by him. S-O-L-R, O-L-A-R building. Does anybody know what a solar building is? An upstairs room. The upstairs, gotcha. Thanks very much, got more light. So that was an anchorage with two floors and one of his jobs was to keep them in order. So the accounts of St. George's Guild for 1391, this is Julian's time, reveal that the anchor Buper, B-E-U-P-E-O -E of Whitefriars, P-R of Whitefriars, along with 16 other priests, was paid fourpence for, to present at the dirge and the mass of the death made for the brethren that had been departed. So they would uh, sing those dirges appropriately. According to Blomfield, the hermit of Magdalene Gates presided over the lepers, while one acted as a kind of a caretaker um, when the church of St. Margaret at Newbridge became disused at the time of the Black Death. Oh, that's interesting. So the playhouse one was emptied and needed a caretaker. Rather less desirable activities are revealed by legal records. At the City Leet Court for 1287, the anchorite at All Saints was presented to court because he had stopped up the Cocky River so that no one could pass thereby. Another there are three cases. A second case is in 1312. The court imposed a fine of two shillings on Robert, servant of the anchorage of Newbridge, because he digs up the King's Highway outside St Augustine's gates. And the third case was the Norwich Consistory Court of 1520. Robert Evans was accused of defaming the character of Hugh Kestrin, anchor of the Greyfriars, by implying that he had fathered a bastard. But this, it seems, by the court's findings, was quite unfounded. So to turn again to spiritual matters, it's clear that recluses often acted as confessors and spiritual counsellors. Richard II and Henry V both received guidance from them. And the will of John Lestrange of Hunston contains a bequest of three shillings and fourpence to one Richard Francis, anchorite, my confessor. Marjorie Kemp, of course, was bidden by our Lord to go to an anchoress in the same city of Norwich named Dame Julian. And so she did. Much was the holy dalliance that the anchoress and the creature had. This creature is um, Marjorie referring to herself. Much was the holy dalliance that the anchoress and this creature had, uh, it says, and it's probable that the many testators who left money to specific named recluses in the city had had contact with that person uh, in a similar but presumably less dramatic way. Unfortunately, the registrars of the bishops of Norwich do not contain any record of exactly how they did the enclosing of the anchorites. Though this was an Episcopal function and is known from elsewhere and from the services contained in the York and the Sarum manuals. Some sort of vow was presumably taken. However, and Bishop Nike's register from Norwich has a single reference to John Tourney making the profession of a hermit while Bishop Goldwell's register from Norwich records a license permitting an old and infirm recluse at Lynn to spend his declining years at Denny Abbey, indicating that he needed to be released from his vow. A number of male anchorites and hermits of Norwich were priests like Robert, priest anchor of St. Edward's Conisford, 
or members of orders like Kananko, which was a monk who dwelled in the chapel of the field, chapel field, that's 1415, chiefly Carmelites, of which Thomas Scrope of Bradley was the most famous example. John Bale informs us that he was an anchorite at the White Friars for about 20 years before being called to be a legate for Eugenius IV, and he was then consecrated Bishop of Dromore. So you can uh, advance your career even if you've been in an anchorage for 20 years. He was suffragan bishop in the Diocese of Norwich for, for 28 years and spent each Friday in the latter part of his life as a barefoot itinerant preacher in the diocese before he died in 1492, aged almost a hundred. It seems equally clear that a number of anchoresses had previously been nuns, though the title Dame, which is in the deeds in relation to Julian, seems to have been used rather indiscriminately. What is remarkable about, about Norwich recluses is the length of time that they seemed to have led that life. Scrope just mentioned, and Emma, daughter of St. Miles Stapleton, probably spent each of them at least 20 years as recluses in the White Friars, while documentary evidence proves that Elizabeth Scott and Agnes were both attached to St. Julian's Church for about 30 years each after Julian's time. Richard Furnies, we've heard about, um, was a hermit for about 35 years. Julian Lampert was at Caro for 50 years. Julian herself was at St. Julian's, we reckon, for at least 35. All this rather disproves the theory that is sometimes advanced that anchor houses were stuffy, unhealthy places encouraging disease, uh, as in Shakespeare's Love's Labour's Lost, chapter uh, Act 4, uh, scene 3, he refers to a withered hermit, five score winters worn. When they died, it had been traditional for early hermits to be buried in the grave that they had prepared for themselves. As the anchoring rule states rather grimly, God knows the sight of her grave near her does many an anchorist much good. But by the 15th century, it had become usual to be buried in the neighbouring church or at some place so willed. Levitt, for instance, asked to be buried next to his sister in the churchyard of All Saints, Burr Street, while St John's Sepulchre contains a brass to another anchor. Where did Julian get buried? We don't know. It is usual to suppose that anchorages lived essentially by themselves, but there is some evidence of them living together. It's evident from the will of Bishop uh, Walter de Suffield that Ella, an anchoress's niece, had companions at Massingham. I'm not sure what that actually is proves, but I'm just reading what's here. Whilst one of the Langley Abbey cartularies contains a charter of Margaret and Alice, both anchors at the Church of St. Olives in Norwich. St. Olives is the one that's gonna get squished by the new Anglia Square development. Um, that's where that one was. That happened in the 13th century. So Richard Furness's bequests, we've heard him a number of times, he gives bequests to fellow hermits and anchors, anchorites, suggesting some sort of society between them existing in the city. They knew each other. In addition to this, Norwich, it's been said, saw a brief flourishing in the mid 15th century of that group of lay women living a semi-religious communal life or beguinages. One group lived at the tenement of St of sorry of John Pellet at St Swithin's and they were referred to as sorori castitati that is sisters dedicated to chastity as were those living in the northwest corner of the churchyard of St Peter Hungate and those in St Lawrence's parish referred to it in a will of 1446 as I'm going to read the Latin slowly for you sororibus in tenemento nuper Johannes Asker in Parochia Sancti Lorenzi, in Norvicio Castitati Dedicates. Sisters living in that church in Norwich dedicated to chastity. So these communities uh, have been found nowhere else in England while they enjoyed their greatest popularity in the Low Countries. John Asker, who we just mentioned, a powerful city merchant that he was, was in fact born in the Low Countries took out letters of denizen and denization and was tra transacting his business in Bruges when news was brought to him that he had been elected mayor of Norwich. 
Norwich's trading links with the Low Countries were, of course, very strong throughout the period under examination. These communities, however, never attained to the popularity of the bequests to anchorites. So the suggestion is that because we had links with continental Europe, we then had these communities, but they didn't attract so many bequests as the anchorites and hermits did. Finally, we need to consider the fate of the anchorites at the dissolution. This, I'm not going to go into this in much depth. Even before this, the number had dwindled from roughly eight at any given time during the 15th century to six in existence in 1529, the next century, when a bequest was made to each of the four anchoresses and each of the two anchors. All the anchorages had disappeared by 1549 or at least cease to be acknowledged as such. It may be, however, that a few recluses continued to live out their lives in a similar fashion, though stripped of their titles. Because in 1546, just before they all disappeared, John Waterman made a will including the following clauses. And this is where I finish. I bequeath to the chaste woman in St. Julian, sometime anchoress, three shillings and fourpence. This is as late as 1546. Item, I give to Masters Kidman, sometime, Mistress Kid, Kidman, sorry, sometime anchoress of Caro, six shillings and eightpence. And John Swain still left 12 pence to the anchoress at St. Julian's as late as 1547. So not 1546, 1547. Tempting though it is to tell you all about um, Dame Catherine Mann, I'm going to stop there and just point out that it says at the very end of the thing that a fully annotated version of this essay, giving all sources, is available for consultation at the Coleman and Rye Library. That's the local studies library. Yes, so the question is, did it survive the Great Fire? Right. Is it still there? Um, and a copy is obtainable from the author, it says. The author would like to thank Mr. Norman Tanner of Campion Hall, Oxford, for generously making available the fruits of his doctoral research into popular religion in Norwich uh, in this period, and to Miss Carol By, not here by any slim chance. No, Miss Carol By for her patience in typing out the manuscript. So I'm an archivist by profession, um, make no claim to be a theologian or even a historian as such, but what I have found and produced for you to look at in the next room are the few documents that refer to Julian that we hold in the record office, and one or two copies we brought in from elsewhere, and one or two other documents related to the church as well, to add interest. Um, we start at the beginning, I suppose, with the name Julian, because it used to be fashionable about 30 years ago to say, oh, Miss Julian, she's such a humble woman, such a humble anchorite. She took her name from the church, and therefore, as Grace, Grace Janssen says this in her book, we don't even know her name, which is quite appealing in a sort of way to uh, think of that wonderful book for showings and to think we don't even know who wrote it. However, there's absolutely no evidence that she did give up her name. And uh, the name Julian is a perfectly common name. Indeed, we shall see documents. And Howard has already mentioned another anchoress, more or less contemporary, just a few years later, also called Julian or Juliana. It's exactly the same thing in Latin. And um, conversely, if you look at the known anchorites like in St. Julian's cell later on, after the death of our Dame Julian, they don't call themselves Julian. There's one called Agnes, one called Elizabeth, I think I can't remember now. But they, they, they obviously didn't feel obliged to change their name. So maybe on the grounds of keep it simple, it's always the golden rule. We call her Julian of Norwich because it was her name. We um, draw any conclusions you like about that. Um, book is worth thinking about when we think about the book, we think of her, her book, the showings. And we think if we try and move forward. 
or something like that. There's a printed book of the Revelations by Juliana. And if your Latin is good enough, you look at the date at the bottom and see this is 1670. So this is 300 years after Julian wrote it. This is the first time it's been put into print. So what's been going on for those 300 years? It is preserved in handwritten copies. It's worth thinking about how different this makes things. We bought a really wonderful thing, the invention of printing was. Because nowadays, when J.K. Rowling turns out a new Harry Potter, they print out 50,000 copies, and they're all exactly the same. If by some failure in her proofreading, she calls him Harry Pooter on one page, that is exactly printed in all 50,000 copies. And of course, there's nothing like that in the Middle Ages. If we assume that Julian wrote this document, wherever she was when she wrote it, the only way to be copied is if somebody liked it so much, they said, we will go to the labour of writing it all down, word for word. And of course, when you do that with manuscripts, you've always got the possibility that there may be changes made by the second person. Quite often, accidentally, if you've ever tried copying out a long bit of text, it's very easy to miss out a few words. Or you could do it deliberately. You could think this is too, I know an extra story that would go in well here, an extra idea. Or you could think, oh, this is a bit long-winded. I may cut this down. I'll give you a parallel. Gospel of St. Mark, Gospel of St. Matthew. Very identical, word for word, in many places. One copied from the other. Which copied from which? In that case, most people think, Mark was first, Matthew copied and added bits. Matthew is much longer. But there are some scholars still who think that Matthew came first and Mark shortened it. We don't know. And that's why the reason I'm mentioning that is because of Julian's text survives in the manuscript in two forms. And these are known as the long text and the short text, one being four times as long as the other. And which came first. This is a British Library version of the uh, short text. In Julian's case, we've got some pretty useful clues because in the long text, she implies quite clearly or physically states that she has been thinking about these matters for a long time since the actual revelations of 1373. Uh, one stage she says she's been thinking, I think it's 14 or 15 years. And another stage, she says she's been thinking of just three months, short of 20 years. So given that it's written in 1373, that is taking us up to 1393 and suggesting, you don't have to agree, that the longer text is a rethinking after all that time. And therefore, she's added, added much to the original short text. Now, Julian, in some ways, is remarkably precise. For a medieval writer, because she gives you precise dates within her manuscript. You've got the date 13th of May, 1373, for the actual revelations. Some ancient documents confusingly say 8th of May. You may have seen that written in some books on the subject. And I think that is an example of what I was just saying when you're copying. You are making a mistake, because if you think about those in Roman numerals, 13th of May, X111, 8th of May, V111. So if the V and the X are not clearly distinguished, you could easily write that down the wrong one. The date she gives you is that she was 30 and a half years old when she had her revelations. So that takes you back to 1342, 1343, winter of, or the date of her birth and that is why people often in their speculations when they're filling out details about the life of someone like Julian they say oh she must have experienced the dread dreadful terrors of a black death and of course in a sense that's true because black death was 1349 so give your mathematics he was six or seven years old I say the black death was 1349 that's the date it first came to Norwich who recurred almost as badly in later times in the 1360s for example and then, as I say, she thought about it for 20 years and had what she calls inward instruction, which takes you up to 1393. And this early example here of the short text has a bit at the beginning. Let's see if this works. Oh, it does. 
year, it says is a vision, this is presumably added by somebody else introducing the text. Vision showed by the goodness of God to a devout woman, and her name is Julian. That is in Norwich and is on life, still alive, and a domine 1413. So that's giving you another date. So you've got 1342 for her birth, 1373 for revelations, 1393 for insights into revelation, 1413 still alive, still on life. Let's see if I cross that out. What was what was 13 now becomes eight, very like. With the question how, how strong the tail is on the X and the and the V. So those are dates we have for her. The uh, passage Howard quoted from Mar Marjorie Kemp is, of course, a fascinating detail and insight into how Julian lived. Unfortunately, from the point of view of getting the dates, we have to carve against the fact that she doesn't say what date she came to Norwich and saw Julian. Marjorie Kemp is writing, not writing, but Marjorie Kemp is dictating her memories about 30 years later. The general assumption is sometime 1410, 1412, 1413, that sort of time. So, so those are what we know from her own book, Mar Julian's book and Marjorie's witness. The other dates we know are from wills, as Howard was implying. A lot of what we know about hermits, anchorites in general, are from references in wills, where they say things I leave to. Henrietta Hawkins, Henrietta Hermit at Connorsford or whatever it might be, Hawkins. And there are four wills which could he definitely refer to Julian, another four which could, stretching a point to various degrees, refer, refer to her. You, I spent most of you thought about wills in possibly tracing history of your family tree and nothing else. Um, wills are proved in three different courts. Church courts, have will, wills always proved by church authorities. Wills of a sort of lower status of people are proved in the Archdeacon's Court. In this case, we'd be talking about the Archdeacon of Norwich. Wills proved the slightly higher level, people who have land technically more than one archdeaconry, get their wills proved before the bishop or consistory court. <coughs> People who have lands in more than one bishopric get their wills proved before the Archbishop has called the prerogative and court of Canterbury. So you've got those three levels of wills. The stag with the wills of the Archdeacon of Norwich is they don't survive for this date. It starts surviving in the 1460s, I think, too late. Consistory courts, yes, there where we might find references to Julian. It's interesting that Howard referred to the work of Norman Tanner, the great Jesuit scholar. I don't know if, how many of you know or would wish to know, but he wrote the best book by far on uh, church matters and religion in uh, late medieval Norwich, it's called. It's a fantastic book. And he goes through all the wills and draws all these references to all kinds of aspects of church faith between 1370 and the Reformation. And why does he start in 1370? because that is the date of the earliest surviving consistory court wills. So you suddenly got this flood of information, you've got all these wills, most of the people in these wills are leaving money to religious matters of some kind, whether it be the friaries, monasteries, hermits. And I have to slightly amend, I think Ian Dunn's, the impression Ian Dunn gave in there, I think one reason why we have so much information about hermits and anchorites in Norwich is that we have such a good survival of wills from 1370 onwards. We don't have any wills, or very, very few. You count them on the fingers of your hands uh, for all that period before 1370, from Doomsday Book to 1370, just a handful of wills. From 1370, dozens, building up, getting more and more by 1460, hundreds of wills and therefore lots more evidence of later period. And that is why Norman Tanner's book, based entirely on wills, starts in 1370. Fortunately, that's okay for us because we've got the 
references to a Julian. Because, of course, no one knows at what point in her life she became an anchorite, whether she was an anchorite, uh, at the time of her showings, or whether at some stage after her showings she decided to take up the life of an anchorite. It's a bit of negative evidence. There's a will in 1373 by Thomas Whiting, who was a rector of St. Julian's of that date, and he doesn't mention any anchorite being in which, of course, may just mean that he, he didn't like anchorites, or he didn't think they were important. Mm -hmm. um, but but if, it, if, if only his will did say, I leave to Julian anchorite, we'd all be leaping up and down saying, well, be, but it doesn't. That's 1373. The first one that does, I don't know if you'd back, but be able to see these wills, but bear in mind, you can go and see them sitting in the next door room in just a moment. So if any of them sound interesting, make a mental or physical note, and you can go and look at them in detail in the other room. That, for example, if you can read that, you can you can take over as archivist. <laughs> this is actually, you can look at it and think, oh, well, this is a tatty old document. It's actually not a tribute to the conservation techniques of people like archivists and conservators in their record office who've managed to take this pile of what would be a pile of wet papers once a register, but having lost all its edges and managed to preserve every single copy, every single entry, amazing. You may or may not be able to see. I can't see it myself now, I'm getting old. <laughs> there is the word Lego. Not referring, of course, to any plastic toys. And underneath it, Julian Anchoress. I leave to Julian Anchoress. Oh, uh, 12 shillings. This is a will of Roger Reed. This is 1394, so that's the date we've come to. So this is more or less the same date as Julian's showings plus 20 years, isn't it? So, so is that a coincidence? I don't know. This is, this is the first evidence we've got of, of an anchorite. Roger Reed was a rector. He was rector of Sir Michael Cosling. And you want to contrast that thing from an archival point of view with that. Take that off the mud. What I did not say was that I, I mentioned the bishop's court, the consistory court, right? But when a bishop is dead and there's a vacancy, the archbishop comes in, proves the wills, and takes the fees. Naturally enough, that's why he does it. And those wills are in the registers of the archbishops of the time. And those are held as Lambeth Palace Library. And uh, they are important because no less than three of the four wills that pretty definitely mentioned Julian are in the Lambeth Palace Library. By pure chance, I presume. And they are Fantastically well kept. Look at that. Lovely, lovely handwriting. Blow that up. There we are. This is the will of who is this will of? Thomas Eamons, a chantry priest from Aylsham. So another, another priest. And he is leaving money to Julian. Let me find that magic word. Perhaps somebody can find it a bit ahead of me. There, I might carry on with a, a, a bequest to. Four rows down. Four rows down. Find it, thank you. <laughs> well done. Also, right, three and anchorets. Great. So I'm just pointing out this one moment where my pointer is I leave to be divided equally amongst the monk, monks, nuns, amongst the nuns of Caro, 10 shillings. So he's leaving money to the nuns of Caro, of whom there may not be many. many. There may not be more than 10, which they said got a shilling each. And he is leaving other money to Carmelites and to his brother <laughs> and stuff in the parish. Here he's leaving money to Master Roger, recluse at Caro. So there's, there's a recluse actually living in Caro. I'm assuming you all know Caro, probably know far more about it than I do. What we think of now is about the word Caro Abbey, which was, of course, a priory, a Benedictine priory, Caro Priory, 
and it was the only female religious house in Norwich. It was patron of St Julian's. So that is where the link comes in between Caro Priory and Julian the writer. She was anchorite. And I use that word anchorite both for male and female. I mean, if that's not correct, I apologize. So, so Julian was anchorite at St Julian's Church, which was in the patronage of Caro. But Caro also had his own two anchorages. And here money is being left to Master Roger Recluse, which is slightly interesting. You might expect a nunnery or female religious house to have female recluses, but they could be quite happy to have a male recluse as here. And this is absolutely key. Here we are, Julian Anchorite, at the Church of St. Julian. Now that is the only actual document where you've got both those two facts together. You've got for name, Lady Julian, we've got plenty of those, several of those, which have come to some others. And you've got the place, the Church of St. Julian. Every other will, just has one of those things in. It says, I leave money to the anchoress at St. Julian's, or I leave money to Julian, but it doesn't say where she is. But this one, absolutely key, the will of Thomas Eamons, Lady Julian at St. Julian's Church is the anchoress. And this comes from Lambeth Palace Library. This was so important and unique document that I persuaded the Norfolk Record Office and the great payers amongst you to pay to have this copied out and printed out because that was absolutely vital. There should be a copy of this in the Norfolk Record Office. So I say this is a single key document and has not been transcribed fully. Obviously, people are aware of it, but it's not been transcribed fully in any printed text. We've got it in the other room. You can transcribe it if you like and get it published in some learned magazine. And Frank, the word anchorite, so after the name Julian. I think we're well, using anchorite, so anchorite. How do you read that word after the name? Anchorite. So this, so this is my, I think this is the fact that when we look through these wills, either here or in the place in the in the other in the other place so to speak when we go and look at them. She is indifferently referred to as anchorite, anchoress, recluse. Not as hermits. I think hermits are very slightly different again. A, they tend to be all men, and B, they're the ones that do the practical work like maintaining the bridges and things. But the female ones, anchorite or anchoress or recluse. This one, I didn't charge you. It would be expensive having a copy made out because it's just another one. But this one is also in Lambeth Palace Library in the will of John Plumpton. So we've now jumped to 1415. So, so what we've had is 1394, Reed, 1404, Eamon, 1415. This one, Plumpton, John Plumpton, of course. And here, if you come on to page two, and you can see you know, now he's using the word anchoress. I leave to be anchoress in the church of St. Julian of Connorsford. Connorsford's the ward, the area. Um, and, and this is one of the wills that Howard's already mentioned to her ancilla, to her handmaid servant. And on the next line, I leave to Alice once her handmaiden. <laughs> Well, pence surveyor so here you've got contemporary contemporary proof for the existence of at least one servant. This is where we get this from. And one of it's one of the other wills that refers to the other servant, Sarah. In fact, I think it's one I passed over as it not being very readable. It was the uh, Thomas Eamon one, it refers to a servant called Sarah. So you are getting references to the anchorite to anchoress herself and a lesser sum to the servant. And uh, that is 1415, then you jump to 1416, and you get another lovely book. It's still with the Archbishop of Canterbury, it's still with Lambeth Palace. And this is a will of a very high status lady, a very posh lady. This is Isabella, Countess of Suffolk. And there, I 
closed in on what she says, I devise uh, to Julian Recluse at Norwich 20 shillings. So uh, this is 1416, so this is evidence. We saw she was still alive in 1413, according to the evidence of a short text. Now she's still alive in 1416, because Isabella, Countess of Suffolk, is leaving her money. Now, thinking linguistically, what's the difference between this will and the others I've shown you so far? It's in French. Yeah, it's in French. That was a fashionable language of posh people, especially women. Uh, Thomas Eppingham's wife's will is in French, for example. And if you were to sit down and read all this, you'll see which is leaving money to various religious houses within the Diocese of Norwich, uh, female religious houses. And also there's one reference to a recluse, Julian Recluse at Norwich, 1416. So there we've had four wills, which I think most people would happily say refer to Julian of Norwich to give us the date of 1416 as still alive. You do your mathematics, and if I've done mine rightly, I may not have done, she would be 73 by mistake in Julian, so she's already quite elderly. And then you have other wills later, in a sense, as negative evidence comes after this, because in 1420, the then Rector St. Julian's, Edmund Beckel dies, and he doesn't mention any hermit, hermit and right or recluse in his churchyard. Again, is this because there wasn't one? And she died? So say she would have been in her mid 70s, late 70s. Or does he just not wish to leave money to anchorites? Can't tell. Well, that is just the Isabella one written in print. And there you see, you see very much more clearly that it doesn't look like Latin, does it? Really is, is in French, you know, you see, item J O, oh. how you pronounce that word, item J O, devise a uh, Julian Lucius at Norwich, 20 shillings. Quite a lot. And of course, she's much, because the others were mostly 12 pence or something, weren't they? They're suddenly jumping up to 20 shillings. I assume you can re relate old money to new money. And I won't say anything about that, which obviously 20 shillings. And you can see this. The original, once again, you can come and see the original. A little trick here. People like me refer to these things as original wills. Technically, they're not actually the original will. And this would be the same when you do any genealogy or family history research. When you think you're looking at a will, what you're almost always looking at is the probate copy. The will is made, the person dies, the executors take the will down to the probate registry, or wherever that may be, the archdeacon or bishop or in the archbishop, and the clerk there sits down and writes it out word for word for word, stores away the original will in case it's needed, in case there's any legal disputes, and it's then lost in the case of all these wills, which don't get surviving actual original wills to the 16th century. So these are probate copies. Here is a will of a man called Brock Dish. This is again this ne negative evidence, 1425. I think he's making this will. And he's actually living in the parish of St. Julian. You see that there? He asks to be buried in the cemetery of St. Julian. He leaves money for repairing St. Julian. He leaves money for the altar at St. Julian's. Does he leave money to a hermit, anchorite, or recluse at St. Julian's? No. 1425, has she gone? Quite likely, in my opinion. But you may feel free, but maybe you just didn't like anchorettes. <laughs> Here's the will of William Setman. I've introduced this to drag a big red herring across the trail, which Howard has already mentioned. On the second line up, and I apologize for the back, people at the back can't see this. Is uh, I leave to Lady Julian. Look at that. Oh, so I think Lady Julian. Then read it up. Anchorite, again, anchorite, rather than anchoress. Anchorite de Caro. This is not 
Lady Julian's writer. This is the other Lady Julian. Howard's already mentioned Lady Julian, sometimes given her surname, Julian Lampert. She was an anchoress at Caro for over 50 years, or no, just, just under 50 years. So it proves these women can live quite a long time. Um, and I, what we produce for you in this case is not this original will. I think you've probably had enough wills. We've produced the earliest surviving account roll for Caro Priory, and that is the one Howard's already mentioned, which records Julian, this Julian, Julian Lampert, using, well, I presume our servants would have done it, using the bakehouse in Caro Priory. So this is Lady Julian Lampert. Not to be confused with our Lady Julian, because she's a different place. Sounds much the same. You might think Caro's there and St. Julian's is there. But they are totally different. If you're an anchorite in Caro, you stay in Caro. An anchorite at St. Julian's, you stay at St. Julian's. So it's a different lady. That is the will of Richard Baxter. This is 1429, and he leaves three things of importance to an anchorite in the church of St. Julian's. So is this Lady Julian still living on? This is 1428. 1429, technically. And uh, if this were Julian the writer, she would be 86 by now who has another person moved into her cell. You can look at, when you go into the other room, you'll see there's a little label behind each one. It'll help you point out which, which of these different wills. This is, this is one of ours. Now it's consistory court will. Gone home. There I've highlighted the little bits. His dates. 1439, he, he's obviously very fond of St. Julian's. He leaves money to the altar to the fabric and six shillings and eightpence to the recluse. If this was Julian, she would be 96. All right, and finally, if we get beyond the realms of practicality, we have a will of Elizabeth Bloomfield, gentlewoman, 1443, I leave, this is a very confusing one, 1443 now, if this was Lady Julian, our Lady Julian, she'd be 100 years old, I leave to Julian, Juliana, whatever you like, Juliana, anchorite in Connorsford. So here we are, definitely have a woman called Julian, living in Connorsford, as an anchorite in 1443. Some people use this as the evidence to say what I was saying at the beginning. This is a different person who has perhaps taken on the name Julian. This could be Julian herself living to be 100. Or it could be, as I think, Juliana Lampert. The question to that would turn on the fact that Juliana Lampert in Caro Priory is she the same person as Julian Anchorite, Anchorite in Connorsford. My answer is yes. That's just my answer. I may be completely wrong. There's always great big disputes. If you, you do know, you know, the Caro Abbey is just outside the walls, and you know, most of you will come past Caro. Caro, Caro I said, most of you will come past Caro on your way here, probably. It's just outside the walls. So is it or is it not in the city of Norwich? In the 14th, 15th century. I'm not saying talk about now, in the 15th century. Some say yes, and some say no, it's disputed. There were various arguments that it was in the city of Norwich, and therefore in the ward of Connorsford. Um, in uh, 1415, a man was murdered in the field in Lakenham, and his murderers went to sanctuary at Carrow. And the case went to a king's court, called Courtship, brought by the Sheriff of Norfolk, and indeed the Prioress of Carrow wound up in prison at a certain time in this case. But the final verdict of the court was that Carrow is not in Norfolk, it is in Norwich. Therefore, we're in the ward of Connorsford. And if you look at the old free book, which is a massive great book, recording the customs and laws of Norwich in 1453, that specifically says Connorsford ward 
extends to Trouse Bridge, so all the way down to just below us down here, and specifically says it includes Caro. So Caro is regarded as being in the ward of Coniston, and therefore my argument is this is very likely Juliana of Lampert. But if it wasn't, you'd have a confusion of having two people called Julian within the same ward, and you'd thought they'd have to distinguish between them in some way. So I think this, although Bloomfield, I think, gives the impression that Julian lived to be 100, he's based it on this will, which he must wrongly thinks, in my opinion, wrongly, that's not right, thinks to be our Julian. And I think, didn't it say that on the sort of, in the shrine, I think it's, that somebody's altered the date and sometime over the last, I'm such an old man, that was probably 50 years ago, when he altered it. The date hasn't changed. No, not in our time. No, no. So those are your wills, four more or less definite, and then they're getting more iffy as you come down, giving a almost certainly still alive, 1416. Probably, but not certainly dead by 1420, just possibly. The one of 1429 could be her, which would take her up to 86. But I think more likely even that is that someone else filling up, filling up, filling up the, the, the cells there. And then just jumping through the history of later bits and bobs. It's not a good cook. I'm sure there's a fold right across St. Julian. So look at that fold is running right down the middle. And there you are, that's St. Julian, number 22, whatever that is. This is Bloomfield. So this is 1740. And Bloomfield, as Howard told you, was writing in the 1740s, and he says that there were still remnants of the, sh of the shrine, of the cells, really, of the cell, but he doesn't seem to mark it on there. In 1821, a chap called Taylor did this map of all the religious sites in Norwich. This is not showing what things were in his time, but what he thought things were in the Middle Ages. So it's a retrospective map, it's not a drawn map. One reason I put it on is you can see Caro down there. So you can see there the city walls. So we are just outside the city walls at Caro. St. Julian's, of course, is up here. And if you look at a larger map, you can see the how close St. Julian's Shrine must have been or was to the uh, Austin Augustine Friary. So it's a group of friaries there on King Street, a group of friars, and they are very close to St. Julian's. And he, if you just see that, we've well, got the map on outside later. He, for some reason, put the anchorage there right at the end of the churchyard. Um, which way are we looking? Away from King Street, so it's up the hill. On the west side. On the west side, exactly. So. Well, I have no idea why he does that. If you look through his book, which is called Index Monasticus, he has about two lines on Julian, but he doesn't say why he has placed her, her anchorage at that part of the, of the... Yes, I just downloaded that, that's just to show you me. 19th century, I presume. I come to George Plunkett. Anyone interested in history of Norwich, look at George Plunkett's photographs online. Fantastic collection, more than just photographs, engravings, and like this. So is the St. Julian's of the 19th century, presumably, late to 19th century. No sign of it. It would be on that side if it was either just beside the chancel or, or if it was further west. And this, of course, when we think about St. Julian. And well, where well, we go and look at now, of course, we have to allow and be aware of the bombing of the Second World War and the war damage to, to the buildings. So this is here. This is drawn up, as you can see, where people, the diocesan authorities are claiming money for war damage. There they show the church as it was just before the war. So this is like a before and after thing. There it is, just before the war. There it is, during the war, just after, obviously, the air raids. So you see the towers come down, the porch has come down, the roof is obviously all gone, and quite a lot of the... I get, I always get confused. West, east. West, east, that's the south side, is it, Howard? I get confused, which is mostly gone. Yeah, so the south side. Mostly south side gone. Yeah. 
and this I just put it in because I know it aroused my curiosity because it's in the same booklet so it seems to imply this was the first proposal for what they were going to build with the war damages which you can see is rather different than anything we've got today just look at those huge square windows and nothing left of the tower at all by the totally taken away and no shrine or cell no cell there is a monument you're probably familiar with if you're not familiar with the glass one, that's in the, <coughs> not in the church of St. Julian's. That's in St. Thomas Hayam, or Hayam, however you like to pronounce it, on, on the Ellen Road. St. Thomas Hayam, 1950s, 1960s, designed in glass. And you can see there, she's called Juliana. So he's quite right, it's Juliana. I don't know why she becomes Julian, really, to be honest, because women's, you expect women's names to end in A, don't you, in Latin. So. And as I did in all those wills, all those wills said Juliana, often Juliana, yeah, with an E on the end, because they're dative, I give to Juliana. But somehow she has become known as Julian of Norwich. And of course, in the shrine itself, that one on the left. And I put on this one on the right, because I just came upon it by chance in the Rosary Cemetery. This is Paul Raybold, who was rector at St Julian's from 1925 so he was there during the time of the air raid the bombing the destruction and played an active and major part in getting the church rebuilt according to what we see today Paul, Paul Raybould. If you want to know more about that story you want to turn up a book by Nick Groves who's a good expert in all this matter Nick, Nick Groves and tell you all about Paul Raybould what I was going through the Rosary Cemetery by chance, and I just had to notice it. So, oh, we'll stick that in. I'll be an extra bonus, an extra treat. As you can see on the on the side of it, it has got the crucifixion, hasn't it? Unusual in the sort of nineteen fifties lay cemetery, really, and very similar to the sort of style of the of the crucifixion image in these glass glass windows with their devotion to Julian. So I think he's he, he's taking that. Or he or whoever designed his gravestone is taking that idea of 650 years ago of the vision to St. Julian and still finding it relevant to his own grave in 1952. So that's 650 years of history condensed into 35 minutes, and that's <laughs> probably quite enough.